Welcome to Roadcase, the podcast that explores the live music experience. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg, and I'll be taking you on a journey through in-depth interviews with performers and key people in the industry to explore the magic of live music, how it can be totally transformative for both fans and performers, and we'll look at how they take it all out on the road. It's going to be a great ride, so here we go. Everyone, welcome back to Roadcase. I'm so psyched to be here. Thanks for joining me. I'm your host, Josh Rosenberg. Uh, we got a great episode today, and we got plenty more coming up, so stay tuned for that. Um, as I do at the beginning of these episodes, I'd like to encourage you to get involved with the Roadcase community, and there's a couple different ways you can do that. Um, you can send me an email at info at roadcasepod.com with your questions, concerns, and uh just to say hi, I love email. I mean, who doesn't love email these days, really? And uh, you can also contact us on social media. Our handle is at RoadcasePod. We're on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So join up there and uh, hit follow if you can. That would be cool. we got a YouTube channel, Roadcase Podcast. Uh, also, you can join the party over at Patreon. we got a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcase pod where you can uh, join roadcase and support roadcase uh, which allows us to continue to bring you these great episodes you can also help us by rating this podcast on your favorite listening platform and if you're listening to this now on like itunes or something for example you can pause it uh, and uh, rate it and uh, review it and come back. That would be really a uh, great way to support this podcast in a more uh, economically manageable uh, fashion. And um, if you are able to uh, support this podcast and you'd like to jump over to Patreon, that would be great as well. And that would be much appreciated. Thanks so much for your support. Okay, so for this episode of Roadcase, I'm really excited to welcome John Vanderslice to the show. Um, I know you'll really find this uh, this interview super interesting. John is both a studio artist and a producer who runs a production company called Tiny Telephone in the studio that once used to be in the Mission District in San Francisco, now is in Oakland, and uh, John lives in Los Angeles. And uh, although he's a Florida native, he's been in California for almost 20 years and much of his work reflects his love for the California landscape and that uh, lifestyle and vibe which I find interesting because I myself is from LA and kind of have an appreciation for the same thing but John's studio albums are amazing. He uh, He's recorded over 10 albums, uh, a handful of EPs, and has worked with um, a number of different bands, uh, namely Mountain Goats, Strand of Oak, Spoon, Death Cab for Cutie, Slater Kinney. He's also recorded a version of David Bowie's Diamond Dogs, which is an album that's near and dear to my heart, so I love him for that. But John is a self-proclaimed agent of chaos. He loves anything that's different. I mean, not anything that's different, but he loves uh, unique performances in live settings or unique recordings in a studio environment. Um, much of his work is an experimental of nature, but he says he's also obsessed with live music um, but is also critical of live music and the way that it can be uh, loud and overpowering for all the sort of wrong reasons of placing so many people in one place at one time um, or just being in a bar and having a lot of ba loud background noise. It's kind of the nature of how he uh, looks at music and of being sound and an expression of what a band is capable of doing and he uh, has he posits that perhaps that's not the best representation of the music um, so we talk about a number of different types of live performances and we even talk a little bit about fish we talk about his favorite band Radiohead uh, and we just talk about how even the most minimal type of live performances can be the most interesting for him it's an interesting perspective on recording from John Vanderslice. I think that you'll really find it uh, informative and interesting and it does provide an interesting perspective on live performance from someone whose uh, work is 
for the most part these days, uh, confined to the studio, obviously for COVID reasons, uh, but someone who's, I believe, whose real heart is in studio production, and he's built a career around that. Um, I love his albums. He's got a EP coming out in April, and he's got a new LP coming out in August. Um, that'll be like around a, a dozen different LPs that he's produced in his uh, 20 odd something year career. I really enjoyed this conversation with John. He's an amazing conversationalist and uh, uh, very intelligent voice uh, in articulating his arguments. And we have um, we have some lively discussion about live music versus studio performance. So thanks for joining me for the special episode of Road Case. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. I want to thank John Vanderslice again for taking the time to be here on Road Case. And here we go. All right, John. Hey, how's it going, man? It's going Thanks great. Thanks for joining me on Roadcase. Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah. So you still haven't told me where you're located. Are you in Oakland or are you in LA? I live in Los Angeles. I live in historic Filipino town in Los Angeles. <laughs> nice. I grew up in LA, so I'm a hometown boy where, there. W- where did you grow up? I grew up in the Valley. I'm a Valley boy. <laughs> what what, what in, city? Uh, Sh- Sherman Oaks. That's great. I love yeah. it, man. The yeah, Valley's yeah, yeah. great. P.T. Anderson, to, uh, you know, like that. that's some classic <laughs> shit up in the Valley. I love it. <laughs> What's P.T. Anderson, the by the way? <laughs> what? Oh, the the filmmaker. He, you know, like oh. Magnolia and stuff, you know, he, he's. Oh, he's, yeah, yeah. He, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, he's Magnolia obsessed. Was, he grew, um, yeah. Yes. That's Wes, there, An- you know, he was grew, Wes Anderson. No, that's Pete. That Wes Anderson is the, the guy who makes everything symmetrical and look like some kind of French fairy tale. You know, like, uh, like, you, you know, like, uh, B.T. Anderson is Boogie Nights, Hard Eight, Boogie Nights, uh, Magnolia, oh. The Master, you know, okay. like, all right, uh, all right. my, my bad, Thread. but yeah, I remember Magnolia was all up in the valley. Yeah. When I yes, watched that, I'm like, oh yeah, done, so is Boogie yeah. Nights, of course, because so Boogie, Boogie Nights was Nights. like the seventies porn stuff was out like yes. way out in the North Valley. Yeah. So, you know, LA pretty well. And even... I, I do. I, yeah. I, I mean, I I just moved here a year and a half ago, but I, I, I've always visited here and played shows here and I I love living here. Oh, cool. 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 I mean, it's clearly a departure from the Bay Area, but since you're not a total California native, you don't get into like the competitions between North and South. Nor- Northern yeah. I mean, and I grew up in, in Florida. To me, this like, first off, it's one sided, like the no one cares about the Bay Area at all. Do you know what I mean? It's like, San Francisco is like a tourist town that thinks it's like an art center. You know what I mean? So, <laughs> I mean, and it's fine. It's like it's beautiful and north enough. That's and a north of San opinion, Francisco. But... <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and listen, I I lived there for thirty years, so I, I have a complicated and deep love of the Bay Area. But but there is a the the kind of cultural overlay I could do without. You know. So if you're running your studio in Oakland, um, are you? I mean, obviously that's that was one of my questions like how's what's going on with that this year but also it's kind of if you live in LA that sort of begs the question how are you running the studio in Oakland well that has to do with genius engineers that work in the the studio who are just amazing and like really the the primary engineers now are Bo um, Sorensen and Miriam Kudus and they, Mm -hmm. they you know they're very experienced they know the studio inside and out. They take care of a lot of issues. They give me heads up on stuff. I do go up and down. So I and I I love going up there. I mean, it's a blast for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so it just has its own. It you know, I think because the studio it's in its twenty third year, twenty fourth year. I think that because it has this kind of um, momentum, and Oakland was way better built and better designed than the two rooms in San Francisco. So it just needs less upkeep. It's not as fussy. Um, it just kind of runs itself in a weird way. I mean, it doesn't mean there aren't crazy problems. We had our air conditioning went out. And, you know, when you're in, you, we have a machine room with like very, like, I don't know, in a, inefficient machines that create a lot of heat. So you have to run air conditioning 24 hours a day. Our right. air conditioning went out, and it's probably going to be five or six grand, and that happened yesterday. So, oh, you know, shit. stuff happens all the time. So, yeah. Oh, man. Wow. I feel your pain on that one. Yeah, it's <laughs> real. <laughs> um, 
Well, and during during this COVID period, I mean, have you been have you had recording going on, or how, what's kind of been your um, uh, your routine with that, and what have you um, pivoting or or not? I mean, it's it's it you know it's been fucked up. I mean, there's really no pivot you can do that doesn't make you look like an idiot. You know, like I remember when Abbey Road <laughs> started selling coffee mugs, and I was like, man, if the, we if we ended up doing that, I'm I'm out of here, man. Like fuck this shit. Like you're you know what I mean? Like like just pick a road. But like if you're gonna be like you know, selling knickknacks, then, you know, don't, I mean, we all have legacies to protect. So we well, just, hopefully you'll no have, p- you'll have 50 years to 60 years of experience at your oh, shoulders and people yeah. could, oh. to, that if people are buying your coffee mugs, I mean, that's a good thing, right? Sort yeah, of. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. I get, I guess, but I mean, it's like, I mean, I, I'm, maybe I'm like a ridiculous purist, but I, I, li- I like when, when kind of like, I don't know, like electrical audio Albini studio. He just like records records. You know what I mean? I mean, I'm a simple man. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I just think that like these are, you know, you you should you should be. I I always think that studios should be sold out every day, and they should just they should really just stick to art making. That's I'm I'm like old, old school in that way. But we well, I we, think I think when I was saying pivoting, I kind of meant. Have you changed the way that you're recording there because we we're in the middle of a pandemic? Well, it's wild. We, it's wild. We, we really, it's so bad for studios that there's actually nowhere to pivot to. It's, it's amazing because right. you just, you like, just can't do what you're, you can't, just can't do, do, any, do it. We can't, we can't do anything. We can't do, we haven't done remote recording. We haven't done, it's just like, it's, it's, we just close, you know, basically like yeah. if there's like shelter in place, we close, we closed like two or three separate times for yeah. months and months. So we got last year, we got clobbered. I mean, it's a little bit better now, but the, the studio rate and the studio system is predicated on like being sold out. So it's been it's been terrible for us. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, just I got guess... like bumped off unemployment. So you know, oh. it's 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 like a rough moment. Yeah, and no, I mean, I was just trying to ask a softer question than "What the fuck are you doing right now?" <laughs> yeah, and there is no, there's no softer. <laughs> so, what I mean, the fuck are you we, doing right now, John? We, you know, we're we're waiting for vaccines to kick in. You know, you got ten percent of Californians have their first shot. So yeah. all we can do is like hold out. Our rent in Oakland is relatively low because our landlord's amazing, and he's been giving us a, you know, he's been charging us half rent since the beginning of COVID. Right, and that's great. You know, I don't know how we would have survived otherwise. So, yeah, I mean, still, I cannot imagine the the body count at the end of COVID when it comes to studios, venues. I mean, you're talking to everyone. You you, you see what's happening. Bands, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, artists, we they're, get getting, the, they're getting. We oh, said the Save Our Stages Act was passed. So that's yeah. sort of beginning to trickle down. But still, and it gives a little bit of comfort to venue owners because they know they're going to be able to pay employees some possibly some back wages, definitely yeah. be able to keep a roof over the head for for the time being, I mean, that was, that was much deserved and much needed financial assistance. I, I can't imagine if you're not, I mean, that's only save our stages. That's not save our studios. Right. I mean, it's a little bit unfair. right? Well, and we know all of the other infrastructure that's in there, you know, like there's like people who do lighting and sound. And I mean, there's so many people that are just not going to see any of that money, you know, and like, well, let's bartenders. Maybe, and I hope they do. I hope they do in some way, but you know, me too. No, I'm hearing shows coming back in 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 the fall. Maybe some partial stuff in the summer. Um, one promoter I was talking to was saying that um, why would bands do a partial? Why would they tour and just do uh, partial capacity venues when they know there could be full capacity venues coming soon in the fall? Yeah. And t- take a- yep. So there's that aspect too of at some point yeah. there's going to be a business decision from a band standpoint, from a promoter standpoint, from a venue standpoint that says. Why would we do partial? <laughs> we'll just yes. wait until we can do full because that's where the business model really works. So there's a lot going on, and and uh. and there's there's simply when when vaccines. Let's just say that like vaccines are available to everyone in July. So you're looking at like you know August first, August fifteenth as the date where if anyone's immunocompromised, if anyone is not a Q wacko or an anti-vaxxer that they can take the vaccine, at that point, you've got to allow like mass gatherings. You just, you, at some point you have to open everything up or it's like you're, you're, you're it's like the, the it's yeah. just, there's, there's no re, there's no arg- counter argument to that. 
there's going to be a point where we're just like, okay, we're all 40% vaccinated. If you're not vaccinated or if you are, just everyone's going to be wearing a mask. So it's just going to have to be just as safe as possible. And yeah, things will start to come back. You know, it'll be a new normal for a while and then it'll just be regular normal, hopefully. Hopefully yeah. the regular normal will be sooner than later. But you did, um, but you did do some rec- of your own recording in 2020. I mean, you've got, you have a new album and you got a, an, an EP, which are just amazing works of art. So tell me a little Thank bit about you. what the process was for that. Well, I, I'm constantly recording because I otherwise, I, I mean, I'm, I'm in a studio now. I have a, <clears throat> excuse me, a studio in my backyard in, in L.A., and that's part of the reason why I live where I live. But I just, I don't think I would survive if I wasn't recording all the time. It's, yeah. it's been, like, incredibly important to me. And um, I, I mean, I made a, a record last year called Dollar Hits and then an EP called Eep, and and... I also finished in the fall another record that's going to come out in in this August called Death Bug. Oh, cool! And then another EP that's going to come out in April that's pure electronic, and it's like a, it's kind of a like a, it's an it's in like an homage to David Berman, who was a lead singer of the Silver Jews and Purple Mountains, mm-hmm. and 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 that's just like a purely like it's a love letter to someone who was like very important to me. Um, so I just I don't know what first off what else is there to do during COVID but like record and it's it's very yeah. hard to record without like the tour um, cycle in effect it actually feels like you're just operating in the dark and also financially it's very difficult not not to have um, not to have like income from touring at least sporadically even you know one offs and like shorter right. tours because bands. It's it's really Im- impossible to put together a recording budget without that. Well, you 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 mentioned it's hard to do when you don't when you know you're not going to be going out on tour. Did you mean that purely from a financial standpoint, or also from a creative standpoint, being in the studio recording stuff, knowing that you're not going to be touring it anytime soon, but, which is presumably both, what occurred but, with those. Yeah, the creative standpoint, it's terrible actually to like the idea of like. So I finished this record. In December, it's getting. I just sent it to QRP, so they're like cutting the vinyl, which is great. I mean, there's certain things that are nice, like you do have like lead time, but like the idea that this record is just sitting there for you know eight months before it comes out to me is so it's just super uncreative. Do you know what I mean? Because it, mm. it puts you in a holding pattern, and we don't even know. I mean, I don't know how much bands are like saying this or admitting this but the idea of playing to a room filled with people in masks make makes you want to hang yourself it's like it's literally (laughs) not why you started playing music do you know what i mean it's like like you it it is an incredibly difficult thing as a super alien notion it just it looks alien too (laughs) yeah and and you are so keyed into the connection of you i mean there's so much um, emotion that happens with people's faces and like screaming and screaming along and like and and being like verbally present and yeah. so all that stuff it it is called I th- what I've seen with my friends in LA is that a lot of bands and a lot of like really creative productive people have just simply stopped recording it's wild they they almost can't they can't connect the dots anymore with why they're doing it. And now all that stuff is going to like, and there's going to be like some kind of renaissance after the shit. There just has to be. But like, I think that there's many people that I know that have just basically stopped because they just, they don't see like the real reason why they should be making art right now. And that's kind of sad, you know? Like, well, well, okay. Yeah. It's definitely sad that that's occurring. But then, you know what I think in the back of my head, I'm like, Oh, that's so cool that people don't want to record because they're not they did the, the specter of not being able to play it live. You're saying ways on creative artists in that yeah. sense. It, that's that's it's that's almost interesting, like in a, though. Tell yeah. me a little bit well, more about that. Well, it feels like you're in a vacuum, right? So like we, you know, if you make records, you it's a conversation with your audience. You know, it it is mm. a it's a it's an it's a life-saving conversation with your audience. And the idea that when you disconnect, bands started like doing like Insta live shows and like kind of dipping into this streaming thing. And it's literally like, I personally like it, but like people fucking hate it. You know what I mean? Like I like it because I think that it's, 
it's better than, you know, it'd be like working out in prison. Like it's better than like not working out in prison. Do you know what I mean? Like, do you want to leave prison? Like not like fit? You know what I mean? Have you been like, watching the Shawshank Redemption recently or something? Or? No, but, but, but I, I, it's funny. Cause I think about that we're in a version of like prison, you know what I mean? It's like incre- incredibly yeah, like yeah, disconnected yeah. and, and, and it's unnatural and, and like, so I just I I know from talking to bands that it's it's a real philosophical problem because they spent their entire life gaining an audience and creating trust and a you know kind of like a aesthetic dialogue with people and it's completely yeah. severed. Not completely, I would argue. But it's yeah, been, not completely. But a, 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 a huge part of it, the actual yeah. real live part of it, the most important part of it has been severed. The most important there, part of but it. But we were talking before about recording in a studio. What's the pivot on that? No. Okay. Well, that's a little bit of a dead end. But the pivot on yeah. not being able to be there, you can still get in front of your audience. It's totally fucking different. And it could suck. It sucks for a lot of performers for sure. But there are others that are kind of making lemonades out of lemon uh, and lemons. And yeah. And, and, and semi, I hesitate to say thriving, but as much as you could in that type of environment are doing yeah. the best they can, you know? Yeah. So I mean, there, it's, there is that. It's wild but, because, yeah. you know, what's been soaked is indie rock rap. I don't see in, in rap. I don't really see the same nihilism. Like I, I see way more productivity in rap than I do in indie rock. And, but I mean, Keep in mind that I'm in the center of a lot of like recording stuff in LA. My next door neighbor is a huge producer. Uh, stu- it's a huge studio, pr- like production place. So it's like, mm. like all I have to do is go on my porch to see who's recording. Do you, do you know what I mean? And it's like, wow, that's it cool. could be Pharaoh Sanders or it's like MGMT or or Wise Blood and like mm-hmm. so, like and the house that I live in is John Conkleton's old house. So I'm friends with a lot of people that are just like super in the center of this stuff, and yeah. like. You know, so I'm kind of basing this on conversations that I'm having with people that are like 50 levels above me as far as like what they're doing and what they're mm-hmm. the the kind of like the, their workload, you know. And, yeah. and I think that, you know, part, part of it is that in, in indie rock, the stakes and the money is so low that it doesn't take much to kind of fuck everything up, you know. And that's that's just the truth, you know. Interesting. What do you mean by that exactly? Well, I mean that like. Bands, and this is why the whole like 25% capacity thing is so funny to me. Bands can barely, and I mean bands that we've heard of, bands that are big, you know, they can barely make money on tour. Barely. You know what I mean? It's like, it's a, if you have a middle class living as an indie rock artist, you are fucking big. And, and, and it's hard to get to that point. So when you start to look at like doing a, a live, kind of like paid streaming show once every two months it's comical and when you think when you start getting pitched for shows at 25 percent capacity playing outside to like these like weird pods of masked people it, the the numbers don't work it's like there's no way you can run that math where it, right. where it actually makes sense to leave your county do you know what I mean? Like, yeah, maybe, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there are there are bands that just do it to get in front of their fans and just to keep their name yeah. out there, and just because they like playing outside live on a stage, yep. you know. And it's yep. something, but yeah the, yeah, the business model doesn't make sense at all. It doesn't make sense at all. I mean, it makes sense like, as like a forward thinking kind of loss leader for your enterprise, yeah, and just a way yeah. to keep playing, you know, yep. because there is there is kind of the added value of just being in front of fans. But other than that, yeah, yeah. you're absolutely right. Um, John, but you're you're known as an analog devotee and traditionalist in that sense. If I I don't, I don't know if that's yeah. the right word. Um, yeah. How does that sort of um, so? What's your thinking on live performance? I mean, we're talking pre-COVID now, right? In the in the actual in the actual real world, let's say. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, getting back to to what used to be normal. Um, how does how does what you do in the studio? And your your emphasis on analog recording um, translate to live performance. We, we 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 touched on that a little bit, but that was more in a business sense. Yeah. But 
what is um what's kind of your view on live performance when you you have traditionally been so much in the studio uh, recording uh, indoors in a studio with other with other bands or uh, alone like what has been your kind of what's your philosophy on going out there and doing things live so I'm kind of a weird person in a way that I, I like have like obsessive tendencies and then I just drop them you know so for years I made you know up and I I ne had never made a record on Pro Tools well I've still never made a record on Pro Tools but but like I had never made a record digitally until last year when I moved to LA and I got this I'm in this very smut a two-car garage that's in the backyard of the place I live in in LA and it was John Congleton's personal studio for a long time. I rented the place through him. So it's kind of set up more as like a project studio. And my first thought was I'll bring a tape machine in here. And then one of my friends, Tabor, who plays in Cherry Glazer, he he oh, like challenged him, yeah. me. He's like, drummer. Tabor's great. Yeah, he's yeah, great. He's, he's awesome. awesome. Great guy. Yeah, I've met him he's, several he's times the... on tour. Yeah, great guy. Whoa, sick. How'd you meet him on yeah. tour? No, just because um, I've seen him several times in Chicago, and That's awesome. I don't know, we always end up. He and I just always end up connecting at a, at, at the, yeah. after the show or something, because he's always outside just chatting it up, and we've had some extended conversations afterwards. And I also was in Mexico City seeing the National last October, and lo and behold, they were also playing in another yes. in another venue like the next night. So I connected with those yep. guys up again, and so you know, That's awesome. when you see people again and again on the road, it's like you kind of connected. They're just the uh, great guys and uh, and clem's uh clem's great and um yeah yeah i saw i saw one of the pictures on your website was from um uh oh her name's escaping sam sam who's the bassist yeah. in cherry glazer yeah. also i was yeah. wondering how are you yep. i w was wondering how you were connected with her but well she, anyway she was yeah she was like she works has been working at tiny telephone for five or six years so like that's oh, i didn't even know so that. this yeah. my world is threaded deeply with all of these people like Tabor is one of my closest friends. I mean, I see. I'm oh, seeing him tonight because oh, we take drugs together. And I saw him yesterday. It's on the Google Calendar. And I saw him. It's oh yeah, it's on. Yeah, we're gonna take a crystal MDMA. I can't wait. We we All we right, take right it right. like every three or four months. Um, All right. Well, tell him and, I said hi, I mean, man. You, you have to have some Hopefully. joy during. Oh, I will definitely. I mean, I see him like probably five or six days a week. So oh we're, great! We're well, very, give him my regards, close. and uh, he know he's just such a fucking rocking drummer too. God, he's damn. the best. He's the yeah, best. just a great guy. That's just a great band. They're they're one of my favorites. Yeah, they're incredible. So he really changed my life because once before I moved to LA, we went out to um, Mexican food, and we, I, I remember we were sitting at this long kind of like group table, and we were sitting sitting together, and I was with another engineer from Tiny Telephone, and Tabor was like, "Listen, when you move into that." To the, to the house in L.A. and you have that back studio, don't bring a tape deck. Just get Ableton and record digitally and ch really challenge yourself. Like, you need to be challenged and you need to have all of these, like, beliefs about recording completely overturned so you can, like, start making different types of music. Hmm. And it was, like, honestly, it was interesting but also exhausting. I was like, fuck, man, I got to, like, get Ableton and, like, figure out how to do this and get better converters and all this stuff. So I t it took me a year, but I took him up on it and I did not bring a tape deck with me. Hmm. And I just ended up getting like a, a like a re the best version of like a di very simple digital setup that I could and it's this is based on like super good converters that like that what they use in like classical music stuff. So they're like that's probably the most exp one of the most expensive things in my studio. So I just started making electronic music because you start making different types of music depending on how you record and what format you're using. Mm -hmm. And so I just became um I just became like totally radicalized. I, I know I don't I don't reject analog recording at all, but I, I just I did it for twenty years and now I'm doing something different and it it is like it's been really difficult for me to make digital stuff sound good but now i've kind of like figured out a system and i'm making stuff that i think sounds very very good and i'm pretty excited about it you know and it's no i and think it's it really sounds di amazing different you know yes yeah, and, and it's totally different and the new record 
Deathbug is a complete hybrid analog digital recording. I mean, it's like definitely like Radiohead style where they're just going back and forth between formats. And it again, it changes the content of what you're doing. And that, to me, has been really exciting. And Tabor has everything to do with that. Wow. Well, that's really cool, oh, but, man. But I'm not answering your a question is is about live performance. So knowing that I've like completely switched to digital, my I've always been kind of like trying to overturn the way that I make music. Mm-hmm. So my my kind of like attitude towards live music is that I'm just simply covering the music that I've recorded. So I'm just like a I'm like an outsider that's taking these songs and I'm free to do anything that I want. Like I did right before COVID, I did a tour in Europe. Oh yeah, so I was opening up for Not a Surf in Europe, and I, I, you know, it was tough. I'm I'm so, playing solo, which I often do because of money. Like I I don't make enough money to ever have, you know, more than like at least a limited series of shows ever have more than one person. It's just that, that, that you know, and I think that a lot of performers, if they're honest about their the size of what they do, it's like they have to like really think about limiting how many people are, on, people are on the payroll because touring has to be sustainable. When I go on mm-hmm. tour, if I'm leaving LA for three weeks or a month, I have to come back with money or it just doesn't sim- doesn't make any sense. So yeah. in Europe, I just brought a drum machine and I brought um, a, a electric guitar and like a weird effects device thing and then vocal effects. And I just cu- did very, very abstract versions of my songs and I took audience questions every night like like that's different fucking questions awesome every that night. is awesome yeah. dude and, and what size venues are you talking about oh shit i mean in madrid it was like 3000 you know so this is a, some <laughs> fucking nerve-wracking just, shit so like i'm up there pa- 3000 people the are like microphone around and like have like yeah. one of those like really stodgy mcs just walk around with a tuxedo yeah. and like give the microphone to the next person <laughs> and, and people would say like have you ever had a uh, sexually transmitted disease or people would say like is your dad oh, still alive shit. or like oh, like shit like that me? Or do you, have you ever fuck. had a drug problem? Or are you in love? Or wow. what do you th- what do you think of of you know like like Finland or what you know what I mean like whatever Q&A it is un- totally unfiltered. That's awesome. It's totally unfiltered and like and it's also I'm very present. It's real. You know what I mean? Yeah, like I'm, I'm, that's fucking I'm, great, man. More there's nothing more canned. Should, more bands should yeah. do shit like that. That's amazing. Bands are fucking boring, man. It's like I, I mean I love live music so much, but. All I want is a real moment. Like I, I remember seeing like a band where the 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 guitarist fell off stage, and honestly, like it was the only part of the show that was fun because it was like happened. It was an accident. Yeah. It was the only time that I felt like they were vulnerable. You know what I mean? Because then they had to like figure out how to get this player up, and like maybe he was injured and he was kind of embarrassed. Right. You saw real yeah. life. You know what I mean? And like that's all you want is a connection with people. You know, and yeah. I mean, I do think it occur- it does occur on so many different levels. But you're absolutely right. I think um, it is kind of part and parcel with that feeling of connection with the band. And when something can happen that's completely unrehearsed. I mean, let's not make an example out of some guy that like fucking broke his neck. But um, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, so, but yeah, but it's that it's that it's that impromptu live experience, yeah. right? Um, that that fuck we need to fucking get back to but now you got me dwelling on it but um that's interesting that you've that you can pivot your live show to make it even fucking cooler because you know if you're only going out with one other person or yourself you're taking questions and you're doing um are, are you feeling like you're able to create your material in a way that you're satisfied with i mean well, it's so it seems intricate and this is the thing is that sometimes Honestly, some of the shows really, really click and some of mm-hmm. them don't. And like, but I would rather have that in a way because it's simply unpredictable. It's not, I'm not, this isn't like tap dance routine. You know what I mean? I'm going yeah, out yeah. there and I'm, I'm like, I'm changing the set list all the time. And, and mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm, you know, it's, it's the quality of the connection depends on like, the quality of the audience sometimes, you know what I mean? And like, and sometimes it's where my head's at. Sometimes I'm really tired and I'm really burned out and I'm like, or I'm depressed or I'm like anxious because some weird shit's happening in the studio or, but like, but it's whatever happens, no one's going to say that I'm not present. 
and no one's going to say it wasn't a real like show, a real moment. You know what I mean? Because I'm I'm there and I'm trying to navigate. And I've I mean, shit, I played a show once in I've never canceled a show, right? So I've played like about 1100 shows. I've never canceled one show. But the downside of that is that sometimes I've played through like really intense like flus, sicknesses, whatever, like a once I had an infection on my hand that was so intense they had to like cut open my hand and like drain out like all this shit but I played shows where I could barely like actually play my guitar so I would switch to keyboards or you know so in other words I the show must go on I mean I played a show in in New York at the uh, Music Hall of Williamsburg that was probably one of the roughest shows I've played in the past year right before COVID where I had to change the key signature of the songs because I had lost my voice from being sick and mm. And keep in mind, I never feel guilty about this stuff because I don't drink or sm- do drugs on tour ever. I've never had a drink on tour once, ever. And I like alcohol and I like drugs. So this was a decision <laughs> I made very early on that I would never, ever drink on tour, even on days off. Never. I've never smoked weed. I've never done drugs. I've watched oh, I've watched nothing but good bottles of fucking wine in France go down someone's gullet that wasn't me. But, like, you know what I mean? Like, I've given a lot of my backstage yeah. alcohol away to people, but, like— but so, but once in a while you get sick, nonetheless. And the, and the reason why I don't drink on tour is that it simply affects your voice. And same with weed. Like weed mm. lowers your immune system. I'm more likely to get a cold if I smoke weed. So it's like I'm very, very superstitious about these things. Yeah. So, but like, so the show in William, I was so incapable of really singing that like I probably talked for 30 minutes out of the 40 minute set. So, and there might have been people in that audience that was like, this is a fucking shit show. Shit show. And there was probably other people that were like, this is one of the weirdest, <laughs> coolest shows. Because I wasn't <laughs> up there like doing a ham-fisted routine. I was talking to people. You know, I was like yeah. really, really engaged. And ta- my ex-girlfriend was there, Dana Locke. And she, in many ways, was the love of my life. And I was like talking to her doing... And I'm not just... It's not a routine to like... Like show like, look, I can cry on stage. It's like I'm actually just having a conversation like I'm having with you. I'm trying to be as direct and as simple about communicating on stage because, I mean, part of it is that I saw before I played a show, I started going to shows when I was 15, 16 years old. Mm -hmm. I love fucking bands. I love music. It's my life. Yeah. But there was a point where I would see my heroes and I would realize that my heroes were actually not in the room. They were simply robots. They were so burned out and so disconnected from playing live that they actually wouldn't even really, like, acknowledge where they were. Or I know they were just saying canned shit. And these are big bands. And then when I started opening up for bands, I was very lucky to start opening up for the Mountain Goats. And Mm -hmm. Darnell is the most direct and honest and transparent and least performative person I've ever played. And then I also started opening up for other bands that were huge that would literally say the same shit every night. And I Mm. was like, fuck this, man. Like, these are my heroes. And they literally, they're not there. They're not, they would say fascinating shit backstage. And then they would go on stage and then they would be like, this is a song we wrote for blah, blah. And I'd be like, dude, you can't say this again, man. You cannot repeat yourself. <laughs> and this right. is there. And there might be people out there that are like, wait, I'm going to see a band play songs. But for me, I simply was like a drug addict that was no longer getting high off heroin and I needed fentanyl. Like it wasn't enough for me to see songs. I didn't fucking care anymore because I'd seen so many good shows that I needed mm-hmm. connection. Do you know what I mean? And like I needed Re- I needed to feel that they that there was something at risk because there I don't want to see a band at rehearsal like bands can play their fucking tunes you know what I mean like I've seen the same band yeah. fifty times yeah. and like you want a connection you know yeah you want um, someone to be present in the moment and just kind of just be authentic whether it's of themselves and their personality and who they are as a yeah. human or if it's through the music do you think that can be achieved as much through the music as it can be in just those moments that are kind of offbeat like so, doing q a or talking more to the audience so, well this is the problem i think i don't know the band fish at all i honestly don't know any songs and once my one of my best friends jamie riato he bought me a ticket to go see fish because he was like listen 
this might be embarrassing for you, but you might love, you know, it's like a band that he was, you know, we all have bands that we're like embarrassed of, you know, because we're not sure how to gauge where they land now. And they were huge to us when we were 15 years old, you know, and Mm -hmm. I have many bands like that. And I'm an anti-snob. I don't give a shit about like a band's place in history or their the critical consensus. So I was stoked to see Fish, but he ended up can he got really really sick and he canceled the show. So I never saw Fish, but I would hear stories of Fish like covering the White Album or covering like these crazy records and then never doing it again and then playing mm. Songs that were a cappella when they're not even like trained singers. And I was like, that's for me. Like, that sounds fucking exciting. That's yeah, the riskiness it's, it's that I'm talking awesome, about. awesome, dude. Hell right? Yeah. That's what I'm Hell talking yeah. about. Because because when you see a band, right, that like like is amazing, I know them, If especially if I've been on tour with them, I'm like, whoa, they're playing this song that they've probably played like four or five hundred times. There's no way there's any variation in it. Do you know what I mean? It's like, there just simply isn't. They could probably play a very high quality recording of this song and mime it, and, and we wouldn't notice, you know? Uh, I, would, like, I would probably tell you that like major fish fans will tell you there's differences between versions, but you know, oh no, it's but very that's what, But I'm excluding, but I'm excluding fish from this in a way because fish concerts, as my friend has explained it, they're filled with improvisatory moments and also right. unscripted, open ended, like musical dialogues between players. And I also know that the keyboard player tours with some fucking crazy real keyboards, which I also have a lot of respect for. So, Mm -hmm. but I'm really talking about like kind of indie rock bands. Listen, the culture in indie rock is, is, it's pretty vanilla. I rem- I've never heard the band The Black Lips, but someone told me a story of seeing them and like one guy was like peeing in the other guy's mouth. And I was like, that's for what me. Like, like, honestly, like, I'm like, Seriously? you know what I mean? Like, that, like, like, there's nothing in me that wants to see that other than that's not a scripted moment. Do you know what I mean? I'm just like, I have you're just, so much you're, you're respect. A pure punk, you're a pure punk rocker in I'm like an indie uh, in overcoat ways. with like uh, hip hop and mixed in. Yes. Hundred percent, hundred percent, and like, right. and like, so yeah, I am. There's must be some, and I also am an agent of chaos. You know, I I want, to, but but at the, but at the end, I love kittens and like herbal tea, and I'm a like a I'm a fucking normie <laughs> who wants to see. I want to connect with people that I love. That's it. That's what's it. your What's Connecting. your take on Matt? Ba- what's your Matt Berenger take? Uh, I who I don't know Matt Berenger. of the national of the national. Oh, I I did I opened up for the National five times and they they were unbelievably good band. Incredibly Just because good he band. he'll he'll have these moments where he'll he really really loves connecting with the audience. Yeah, and that's a band that you know they they won't change up their set list incredibly. I mean they'll they'll do some shows that are pretty extraordinary and they'll throw in a couple of interesting covers from time to time, but. Matt will get up there and he really, he finds comfort in connecting with humans. That's when love he's it. the most comfortable. We'll jump into it. the audience, stand up on the front rail with holding everybody's hands and being held up himself and just be love part it. of the entire thing. Singing yeah. with other people, giving the mic to people, singing. I mean, I think, I still think one of the most difficult jobs is probably their sound guy, their front of house sound guy who's yeah. got to like figure yes, out how to turn on, that. turn down the volume at the right yeah. moment. So <laughs> when he hands yeah. the mic to somebody else, but yeah, but he's super fully in the moment with the audience and wants that connection. And it's something that yeah. even if you're not that person that he's talking to right there, it's everybody yep. else that sees that and it's infectious. And yeah. Yes. So. And it, and it's not about monologues because I saw um, Perfume Genius right before COVID and he didn't talk tons, but he was so fucking charming. He was so absolutely elated to be like in front of that crowd and that 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 so it's not really about like killing the vibe with like a 20 minute story about yeah. their alcoholic well, dad which is something i would do you know what i mean but like, i don't know if it's killing the vibe those are your words man it's yeah that's true um no but explain that more so that i, I didn't really where were the, the with perfume genius oh yeah so i saw perfume perfume genius at um outside lands in san francisco and he was just like, you know, it's it's a festival show. So those are tough. You know what I mean? Those are yeah. those are the really the shows where you feel like, whoa, this is like karaoke, you know? And like 
he was just so fun. And, and he was talking about being there and being in San Francisco and what was happening. And like he mm. was just like kind of goofing and being very vulnerable. It was for me, it was, it was a great show. It was kind of unforgettable for me. And I'm, well, I'm yeah, I mean, festivals can be thing. can be a blessing and a curse. I mean, it, yeah, it depends on the band, mm-hmm. like you're saying. I mean, because you can get up there with possibly a ton, half of the f- people don't know, less than half don't know who you are. Yes. Right? Yeah. So it's a challenge, but it's also an opportunity. And if you're yeah. that kind of performer that can just draw everybody in, all of a sudden, boom, instant 7,000 more fans. Yep, right? absolutely. So how does... um. So for for the bands that come work with you in your studio, how does um, is it important for you to understand how they play live and how they like to play like physically in that sense when they come to you? I would say it's very important for me not to know that, huh? Because in in, gen- in general, it would be a terrible thing to take into account because it's incredibly limiting. For the worst experiences that I've ever had, actually recording bands have been when they're very, very conscious of, like, we this, you know, we need to do this in a way that we can replicate live. That That's just the kiss of death. I mean, that's, you should just, like, lock up the studio and everyone should go home. It's well, I never don't necessarily mean that way. I mean, is it important for you to know, like, how they like to, not so that you, how they like to play live, not so that you can allow them to create something that they could replicate, but... Is it important for you to know what kind of vibe they like to that that they produce when they're performing in front of an audience? I think it's for me, honestly, it's better if the 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 live show history and their future mm-hmm. is in, in in is is like disappeared because uh, like bands need to be constantly to you know and we're, I'm talking career bands I'm talking bands that are going to make like yeah. five plus records that need to start completely almost being like 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 revolutionary in the way they that they think about their own music because if 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 you are if you're not a historical and the best example is a band like Radiohead where you have a feeling that they like they do everything possible to kind of like reinvent themselves every record cycle which is very i can just say this from trying to make a different sounding record this is what happens and and i'm talking about someone who's like intentionally making every move to make a record that sounds different than the previous one Mm -hmm. that like you have to start writing different you have to hire different session musicians you have to have different instruments you have to like have different cheat codes you have to break the systems of of like of like composition in your head. You have to change keys. You have to like alter tempos. And then when you like get the record back that you made doing all of these things that have given you nothing but migraines, you've like basically taken this like super tanker crossing the Pacific and made it turn one degree. And it sounds so similar to everything else you've made. So <sighs> keeping that in mind, right? That like yeah. it is actually fucking incredible that they went from OK Computer to Kid A. Like in it's truly truly insane and that that Boney Bear went from like the second record to 22 a million it's truly truly amazing and that that might have been like a- acid hack right there but like it's really right. really really difficult and this is the thing is that if you're going to be a careerist Neil Young you know uh the Beatles Rolling Stones David Bowie the national anyone you have to constantly be overturning i mean look at the side projects that the national are doing you know what mm, i mean yeah. like oh, yeah. like sure. bryce is doing like symphonic shit it's like like in order to keep a career going to keep some kind of like aesthetic freshness you have to be incredibly dismissive about things and to me live music is the most corrosive thing that anyone could know about because it's going to be the dumbed down version it's going to be it's at best, it's going to be all violence and power and like and like like this kind of like this like this really like I don't know like 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 unhinged and and like like temporal playing of the songs that may or may not be able to be reproduced. The best shows I've ever seen have been like uh like bands that have like decided like once I saw Spoon with this like. They played, and I've seen Spoon a lot, and they yeah, added this horn them. section. Oh, they're incredible. Like, oh, so they added this horn section. So I love and, Brit so much. 
Yeah, it's incredible. And like those are some of the best shows. So, but Brit added this horn set, or Brit and Jim and the, and the crew, they added this horn, horn section on like a couple shows. And just that, just that kind of shifting away and having to like, like change the arrangements and to like, like, I don't know, play within these horns. Or I've, I've seen bands play with like Magic Magic Orchestra before. And like yeah. I, anything like that is, it can create like in, an incredibly magic like place. But the the part of and uh, and I'll I'll kind of try to be more specific about what I mean by this. There's there's a problem that bands have. If you get a, a bunch of engineers and producers in a room and you say, "What's the worst thing that can happen?" They're going to say, "A band walks in that has a drummer, a bass player, and two guitar players." Like that's the worst <laughs> thing that can happen. Do you know what I mean? Because one, it's square. <laughs> two, it's knowable. Three, like, you're not fucking the Stooges. You know what I mean? Like, you, the history of rock and roll is looming so heavy on you because that that setup has been rolling for 60 years. You know what I mean? Right. And, like, and like, two, like, two guitars, one, take up an enormous amount of mid-range information, right? And bass and drums, everything's loud. So all of a sudden you're in a fucking club pushing this shitty PA. The singer can barely be heard. So then that means the singing becomes very unsubtle. And that means that there's a war between amplified instruments. And that means that everything's very square, right? It's like very square, you know? And it's it's almost like a square. Two guitars, bass, drums. It's impossible. So, like, I remember... I don't know if I go see a show and I'm looking up and there's like a drummer that has a ver- really weird looking kit that's like wrong. And maybe that drummer has like a monophonic synthesizer on their floor, Tom. And then there's like a nylon string guitar and then there's like a viola. I'm like, we're in business. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> now we're talking. They, yeah, they might. They might. And I'm not just like everything but the kid. I don't just listen to wacky music. You know, like for me, like listening to Frank Zappa, it's like I like that seems like like hell for me. You know what I mean? Like I. So it's like I don't I'm not looking for like the wacky qu- thing here. But what I'm looking for is unbalanced and where people are having to like kind of create their own rules, their own systems. Right. So right. like I mean, I saw this band last year called the Kitty Band and they. I, I, and they're at the playing at the bootleg theater in LA. It's two blocks away from where I live, so I go there all the time. I walk in, and they're setting up, and they have their four players. They have four vocal mics, one floor tom, one kind of table of like janky ass percussion, one um, acoustic guitar, and then another singer with percussion. And I was like, I'm sorry, but they're gonna be great. Like I knew, like I fucking knew it. Like I knew that they were going to be great. It's like, there's no way that they're not going to be forced to do something way more interesting because right. simply they only had one harmonic in- instrument. No low end came from any. There was they were generating nothing below fucking two hundred cycles. You know what I mean? Like it was so weird. And four singers. Yeah. And it was one of the best shows I saw in 2019 or. Tw- yeah, it was 2019. It was. See, I'm thinking about 2020 as a lost year. It's just gone. No, it's me. just gone. No, no one's even. It's, it's not even in the gone. vocabulary anymore. Um, well, that's so interesting because you were saying how you you started out by saying live performance is something that it, it was it was almost like it's so dumbed down because it's got to be this huge emotional broadcast of yeah. Uh, of something that can be accessible to the lowest common denominator almost. I'm not trying to put words in your mouth, but I'm just trying to yep. summarize. But I wouldn't I wouldn't say lowest common denominator yeah, and, and I'll let you continue. Yeah, not, well, neither would I. I know, so. I know, I know you, <laughs> because I do believe actually that audiences for indie rock shows, of which I've been a part of like feels like 2,000 of them, if you add up ones I've played and one I've, ones I've been at, been at or this is these are magical groups of people like and i think that they're in, in general very very educated music consumers and and often intimidating to me like i don't walk into a show being like i'm going to blow someone's mind i'm like fuck i got to play well but c- continue and, and and i'll i'll answer yeah yeah um i i sort of forgot what i was what, um yeah i mean just the that it needs to be a directed and projected live performance with a purpose that you were talking about. Oh, you're sort of making an argument against the uniqueness of live performance from an instrumental and a melodic standpoint almost, which would kind yeah. of make the counter argument that 
recording in a studio is something that's more essential than a live performance. But yeah. I would argue, but well, I don't not necessarily arguing any counter to that. I would tend to agree with that in a first in in a very technical and um, um, with certain parameters that yeah yeah this is the live performance this is studio work but live performance is totally essential to the human experience yes 100 percent. i would say that the contaminating factor with live performance is and it's 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 it was necessary and i i don't think it was an accident but live like rock indie rock country all that stuff it's the the like the 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 baseline was playing in a bar right and it still yeah. is yeah so what and the baseline is playing in a bar where you're competing against like not only are you like given these these like weapons amplified instruments you're given a kind of like a percentage of people that are there not necessarily to see music or you're up against sometimes just purely noise by staff. Like, I mean, I've played yeah, cars where it's like, and all oh, kinds it's, of it's shit. Or, or hurling recycled beer bottles in, in like the most yeah, violent in, way yes. into like, and so there's this part <laughs> of like, sound. it's like a, it's like a war. Do you know what I mean? Like there yeah. is a noise war that happens. So this is, so it's interesting. There's, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So I've seen a lot of bands start out, to having this like delicate conversation. Maybe they start playing in like like more like, you know, like Sufjan Stevens in his early shows or like Mount Erie, you know, the mm-hmm. microphones where you're playing at like art galleries, you know, kind of like like kind of like really cool non no alcohol like like co-ops, art galleries, libraries, stuff like that. Places that I actually play at now. I never play in bars, you know, like unless yeah. I'm opening I'm not big enough to play in a bar. So like so what happens is that you take that into to bars, you dumb down, and then you start playing bigger places and festivals. And then everything, you, you have lighting cues, you have all these things that are just like you're on a road. You're no longer just like in a fucking dune yeah. buggy going through the desert. You're, you're on, on the highway. Like a, it, in traffic, you know what I mean? And like, yeah. so it's not... It's not that people are just like, I like loud rock guitars. It's like they're like, I can't stand so many people talking where I, it's like it's louder than what the noise yeah, we're it's, making it's, on stage. Yeah, it's fucked up. I mean, who, what, who said it once? Like, no, I mean, come on. There was the folk revolution and then Dylan plugged in and then they were like, you know, once you put a drum set into the equation, the guitars have to be amplified, and yes. and then they and then everyone was off to the races on rock and roll, right? And, and Pete Seeger back there trying to like hack, take an axe and hack at the electronic cables yes. backstage yeah. at Newport Folk in 1966, yeah. right? And and could you but imagine it, how quiet that would sound now to us? Which is what really funny if you think. About it. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. But it's about the songs, though. Yeah, it is about yeah. the songs at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, in my, you know, IMO. <laughs> yes, I hundred <laughs> percent. But I mean, because 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 that's what's going to cut through the noise and the distortion and everything else that is part of that live experience for very valid reasons, right? I mean, there is yeah. a communal kind of tribal experience of the yes. noise, of the thump, of the kick drum, of the bass, and everything. But I would argue if it's not if you're not putting it together in a cohesive fashion, that creates a song. Yeah, that it doesn't matter. That it doesn't, that that's but, kind of what, then the clinking of the glasses and the recycled, then it doesn't fucking matter because yeah, it's but, a but, fucking great song. But one interesting thing, though, is that, like, you know, the ven- you know David Byrne has this thing where, the, like, the venues kind of change actually what music is being written. And so think about this. Think about that you you go from these, like, coffee house, like, art galleries, and then you start playing bars. So this is really what, you know, I did for... 10, 15 years was I, I basically played bars everywhere, Europe, here, Australia, Japan. And then if I was opening up for someone, it would be in like theaters. So when I was playing bars, it's interesting because like it would be very common that if you played a bar that you have, you're playing on a stage where there's just like three or four massive subs, right? And the crossover mm. is set so high that, like, if someone just hits a kick drum, it ha- it literally sounds like it's the la- 
<laughs> it's the basiest, Thunderous. loudest thing you've ever heard. And so unless you're bringing your own sound person, which is incredibly expensive, you are being warped in a way. No matter what your intention is, you're being warped in a way and amplified in a way that really has nothing to do with what's happening on stage. Do you know what I mean? So you might yeah. be playing this like this like relatively it might sound like Leonard Cohen up there, but like in 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 you know front of house, like you have like you know a kick the kick drum has like been boosted by like forty dB. Do you know what yeah, I mean? I so mean, it's you're, like it's you're drilling crazy. down into the you're drilling down understandably into this other area of sound and tech technique and uh of projecting sound in an outdoor or indoor environment that's um completely and totally relevant i get it yeah 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 <laughs> absolutely and and that changes the way bands come back to make their next record so i guess just to end this this whole story line that like do uh, this is why i don't want to have any connection to bands live music at all like do you know mm -hmm. what i mean like mm -hmm. i it's like yeah. don't ask don't tell i don't even care if you play live do you know what i mean like right. i want to listen to these songs and i want to make a high art record and that's it well absolutely i totally I, I love that and um but you did hit on something interesting was the evolution of going from venue like your the evolutionary climb of an artist from a smaller kind of venue to you know, major venues that for with where there's some things that are not in their own control from a sound and sound yeah. perspective. But talk to me a little bit about how you feel about playing in super unique venues like that, the that uh, the botanical garden pine grove at UC Berkeley campus, for example, or I mean, places yeah. that are like that, where you really can have that quiet, unique and purely musical experience, or can you? You can. Well, so so th I guess this is an interesting, this would be the moment to tell you how I tour now. So I strictly yes, tour please do. With, with this, com with, if I'm not opening up for a band. So I'm on the books, I have another European tour in September. So hopefully Europe will get their, you know, they're way behind in vaccination. So if they get it together, that tour will happen. That will be an all in theaters. So that I look forward to that. That to me is like a great tour. But if I'm touring alone in the States, my pro the only way I'm profitable is if I'm touring in the house show circuit. And mm -hmm. that's specifically through this company called Undertow, which is based in Champaign. Um, and they have this, like, unique model that was really kind of invented by them and Pedro the Lion, where you have, like, pre-sale tickets only. You have hosts that, like, kind of put together the show and you start the shows at eight, you have no amplification, you have no opener. And often the the hosts will like, you know, bake cupcakes or make like margaritas. Like it's kind of fun. You know what I mean? So like, be, it can be, like private residences. It's private residences. But the interesting thing is that I soon figured out when I started doing this, which was like three years ago, and it changed my totally changed my life that most of the places you play are not homes, but they are like, like I've played a hair salon. I've played so many art galleries that I couldn't even count them. I've played mm. so many recording studios. Mm -hmm. I've played in the backyard of an auto shop. I've played in a garden. I played in someone's backyard where it was like, they had um, like, they were doing like real egg production. So there were chi like dozens of chickens and coops and stuff. And like, you, you, so you could hear, so it was what, part is that, of the is show. Is that worse or better than people throwing bottles in, uh, throwing bottles so much in the better. garbage? Anything <laughs> is better than playing in a bar. I'm just telling you. And So and that's so interesting played, though. Yeah. And so I played like, there's no, I've played it like, a, like, an, like, like art spaces, cafes, like it just goes on and on and on. So, those venues, they're part of the show. Do you know what I mean? Like yeah. when you play those, play, they all have their own acoustic footprint. They all have their own way of arranging the audience close to you or far from you. And like they're, th some of those shows, the spaces fight against you and, and what you're doing. And sometimes it, m it makes it the most magical thing you've ever seen. And so my connection to like unusual spaces is complete i mean this is how i make my money now this is how i live is playing really a random array of like curated i mean undertow is really good at curating 
these places, you know. So, but they're always different, and you don't know what you're going to, you know, I just drive up. I don't look it up. I just drive up to an address, and I'm like, whoa, oh, this oh, is like. No, seriously, you, know, you just, add, like, they give you a list. This is how it works. They give you a yeah. list of addresses, yeah. and you just show up. Did yeah. you, they, would they, they would tell you what it is, but do you ask, like, for them not to tell you? Like, I'm just curious. Like They don't even actually speaking. tell me. They just send me an address. They send me a tour book, and I don't even ask. I just, like, and I don't, I just, <sighs> like, awesome. do the mileage the, the day before, and I'm just, like, and I don't look at what it is. I just drive there, and I pull out my acoustic guitar and my merch, and I, like, I mean, I'm basically, right. I'm there to sell rec- vinyl. You know, I, so I do sell a lot of vinyl at these shows. That's That's really, I'm kind of like a traveling store, you know, And I'm Mm -hmm. also there to, I mean, I play two hour shows solo. Wow. I take questions in real time and I take requests. I probably bring 90 songs with me so I can play a lot of different shit. Wow. And you love that. So you like doing that kind of stuff. It's it's the most fun thing you could ever have. It's the, I mean, really? Yeah. I mean, like I booked a tour that was like three weeks in the Southeast. So I just played like Florida and Georgia and Louisiana. I mean, I just been went swimming every day. I mean, it's like you can completely target what you do and like why you do it, you know, and then you can like right. book days off specifically where you want to hang out with people, you know. Wow. So it's like it's amazing, you know, and like I'll never be able to go back. But like I'm but also I'm saying that from a position where I'm not big enough that I could I'm not turning down bar tours i'm not big yeah. enough to do those it wouldn't be profitable for me to do that i mean right. and many many bands get you know get you kind of drop out of that world because it's simply so expensive when you pay for you know a van and a tour manager and session players or you're divvying up your your take in four, with four people five people no way there's no way yeah Right, I mean, you have to right. be huge to make it. I mean, you can delude yourself to like run, you know, you can do fake math to be like, oh, we came home with a thousand dollars. And it's like, did you? <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of costs before a tour, you know? <laughs> yeah. But from a purity of your music standpoint, do you feel that you'd rather do a tour like that? Or would you rather play, um, you know, thousand seat halls, for example? Well, from a purity of of life standpoint, I'd rather be like mega famous and like play like, I'd rather be like, I saw Bon Iver play at the forum and he sold 12,000 tickets and it was one of the best shows I've ever seen in my life. It was one of the best sounding. That can happen. I mean, this is It can happen. Oh, I mean, I would much rather be rich and famous and powerful and everything, you know what I mean? But like, but we have what we have, you know, and like, I'm very, very... Well, we were making an aesthetic argument and I would, I spoke to you on an aesthetic basis of playing unique places and how that's where yeah. does that kind of fit in in your whole aesthetic and technical view but i well, mean yeah of course like you know we'd all rather play in like 15 you know sell out the la form every night fuck yeah let's say that there was no that there's like i don't have an ego because i have a brain injury and let's say that like you get x <laughs> amount of money regardless of whether you play the forum or like someone's backyard solo my probably the way that i would love to tour is I would love to bring, and I think about this all the time, I'd love to bring two musicians with me who both sing and who are both multi-instrumentalists and who have like very strange kind of like um, instruments with them. Like, so maybe like a very um, kind of like abbreviated drum set or some kind of like percussion drum battery thing. And then a, a couple keyboards and then maybe I'm playing a keyboard and acoustic guitar and we bring our own small modular PA and that we have a sound person that's controlling everything and that we can do those shows and drop them into these art spaces. That to me, I think about that all the time. That is what I would do if I could just push a button, you know, like, like in other words, you have the intimacy, but you also have the flexibility of playing with two. I think a trio is just like phenomenally flexible and with three singers, Okay. Have you, um, in your career, have you done l- l- recording of live performances? I, I did. I I recorded a show that I did at the Independent in San Francisco, and then put it up on my website. And we we really like. I hired someone specifically to record the show as a live show. And right. I, I really I look back on stuff like that, and it just feels like it's barely interesting for me. You know what I mean? Like I've never really liked. 
I mean, I grew up listening to like Frampton Comes Alive, and like yeah, of so course, I guess man. I guess you it can like, be you done. Grew up and listening like, to classic rock, just like man. Yeah, and like song remains the same. And then I found out that those were all like overdubbed after the fact, which I thought was like fascinating, you know. But like, were you a song? Were you obsessed with song remains the same when you were a kid? The the live version of No Quarter changed my life. I mean, that's like <laughs> yeah. the, the like really like that's the main thing that got me into music was that song. The live. I literally version think of no in Quarter. tenth grade I went. I can't exactly remember, but I think I saw Song Remains the Same at least three to four dozen times. Midnight shows. I believe it. I believe it was it. like it's a huge thing. Yeah. And it was this 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 really cool old movie theater and they actually had like surround sound at the time and it was blasting what I thought was blasting Sick. loud. It was it, it was. was I'm sure it was blasting actually. I guess. I can't it was and I was obsessed with that. All that devil Zeppelin. shit, all the all occult stuff. I mean, it just felt like the most forbidden thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> you know? It was amazing. But um, but I, but yeah, I am a rec- I'm a record I'm a I'm a studio per like in the end like if if like I'm on Radiohead's like email list because I'm like a super fan if they send out an email saying oh we just posted this live show I'd be like so what but if but if Tom York said I just put out this like B, you know seaside from this record I would download it immediately you know what I mean like, well is that I'm, because you don't necessarily like the way they play live because that can happen no also. I I've seen them so I think they're unbelievably live I just think that right. there's something about the it's like you're mixing up things it's like you're you know what I mean it's like you're like it's like someone saying, hey, come over to my house. I'm going to make you dinner, and I'm going to do this, like, speed cooking thing where I'm going to cook you and serve you dinner in eight minutes. And you'd be like, why are you combining two weird things together? Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like what what is so interesting about that? Like, 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 what's cool about a live show is that you're in front of these, like, speakers. You know, like, I saw Tom York and Nigel Godrich, like, at um, Hollywood Bowl, and I think that was in December of 2019 or January of 2020. And it was a very good sounding show. I mean, I, kn- yeah. I know just from like reading about what they do that they bring like crazy outboard gear and they bring like engineers to actually mix them. And they have like, you know, one of their like studio assistants is doing live dubbing and like they're they're all in. But right. But there's something about the. I know this from trying to do it, but that when you try to record that, it doesn't work. There's something about it just it's simply it's so inefficient to try to capture that and make the fidelity translate. It's just I've never really heard a live record that was Mm. like was interesting to me. (laughs) Like I know it's out there. I just haven't heard it, you know. Right. Right. That's so cool. But um. Before I let you go, we definitely have to talk about Diamond Dogs because that's like yeah. one of my favorite albums and yeah. arguably Bo- one of Bowie's best albums. If you're not, yes, if you aren't 100%. obligated to say that Ziggy Stardust is his best album, yeah. I don't know. I love. I've always loved the production of oh, yeah, it's Diamond fantastic. Dogs it- itself. I've never even been able to get my brain wrapped around exactly what he's doing on yeah. that album mm-hmm. and that kind of. I like. I feel like it's like this suction almost it sucked everything out except this beautiful beautiful vibe of music i don't know it just it feels it feels it has a feel to it right yeah so just i'm just curious why did you decide to cover that entire album and did you play that one live so we only did that show live once actually we did it at a movie theater and in in san francisco where we 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 were asked to curate a movie and then play a set. So I I did The Science of Sleep, the Michel Gondry movie, and then we played Diamond Dogs Live only one time. And I, I mean, there's probably 30 people there. And that was a good show, too, actually. Um, and so the reason why I decided on Diamond Dogs feels like the most Bowie of all the records that he's made. It's the, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's the only guitar that he played. I mean, the only record that he played all the guitar on. And mm-hmm. it's really the, the record where you feel his stamp as a singer performer producer you know like actively involved participant and it was peak cocaine for him speed Hmm. cocaine whatever his accelerant of choice was you know he i mean he at that time 1974 1973 mick jagger was like saying i'm worried for you 
And Mick Jagger was like going fucking hard, man. Like, like you know, if you have like a drug addict who's worried about you, you're yeah. in trouble, you know. Right. And right. he, you know, he wasn't sleeping, he wasn't eating. He had a, like a really weird diet. He had like really paranoid shit going on, and like, so that record is is unfinished to me in a weird. It feels like broken and unfinished in all of the good ways. Hmm, and yeah. the peak moments of that record are, you know, they're some of the most exciting parts of his discography which says a lot you know and it really is and i think it's interesting too that he started like doing like this 1984 concept record and then he was kind of like threatened with a lawsuit to stop doing that so the the record is really has this like broken feel where it was a concept record that was abandoned it's very personal on some levels and like mm-hmm. um I think his singing is uniquely weird on it and it's and he's doing like it's kind of the height of like that that cut and paste lyric thing he was doing. So I and by the way I gave that record and speaking of like n- people not having respect I hate cover records. I really don't like them. I hate when someone does a cover song or like when there's like a guest musician on something it only it just doesn't work because people defer too much to power, right? So one of the things I did with this record was I, I got musicians who ended up being incredibly important to me after this, but Jason Sloter, Rob Shelton, Jamie Riotto, who I knew, one, they do not care about David Bowie. They don't dislike David Bowie. They don't care about David Bowie. They listen to, like, Mingus and fucking Miles. They don't care about Bowie. They mm-hmm. didn't know the record. Like, I think that they said that they knew the song Rebel, Rebel, and that was it. So yeah. I gave them the record, and I gave them the the chords and they were like no we're not going to listen to the record we're going to do a really weird version of this you're just going to play us the songs a couple times and then we're going to make our own fucking chord chart because they're all weird jazzers they're all out players and they can they're like so good that they can just hear like a chord pattern they're like yeah we get it we understand what's happening and they're not dismissive they're not snobby at all and so that's the sound of that record was like a bowie lifer who's fronting a band of, like, very smart out musicians who have no respect for the material in the best way. So that record was done in three days. No so, kidding. And it was hard. It was really difficult. But I like that record a lot because it feels like it is not doesn't defer to, like, Bowie as an artist. It's just, like, a weird, very weird, imagist, surrealist version of that record. Yeah, no, I loved it. I mean, I it's kind of ingrained into my whole psyche as Diamond Dog. So even if you weren't being completely um, referential to the album, I mean, it was it was there for sure. I mean, yeah. it, I really, yep. really enjoyed it. <laughs> yep, that's cool. And it's great stuff, man. It's great stuff. Um, and I heard you talk about the Cedars recently. What's your most recent status on your obsession with that place? <laughs> oh, God, yeah. So Because now is- I'm definitely, I'd not heard of it, and then I was looking it yeah. up. Um, which for, for anyone who doesn't know, I mean, that's, that's the, you're like two albums ago and it's an amazing album, but it's named after this, uh, land reserve up yeah. in uh, north of Sonoma or in Sonoma yeah. County. Yeah. In but, Sonoma County. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I, I have to go visit this place. I, why, what is your, what's your obsession with this place in a good way? So it's like an 11 by 11, um, roughly area of Northern Western Sonoma County picture you know douglas fir old growth redwoods bay laurel madrone tan oak coastal oaks like it's fucking beautiful and it's very low density out there so there's like you know there's thousand two thousand acre parcels strung together and it's a lot of a lot of weed a lot of wine it's a really good food it's kind of like a, a a i would say the most underrated county in california and I co-own some land within a collective in West Sonoma, and maybe five miles north of that land is the Cedars. And the Cedars is interesting because it's a geological anomaly where there's like this kind of like, I don't know, lower layer. I mean, I'm not a geologist, but like this like kind of lower layer of like strata or whatever that's been pushed up through either earthquakes or some like accident. And so you have this exposed... I don't know, it looks like molten like lava or crust of the earth. And right. the soil is incredibly base. So what that means is that it has created plants 
that are endemic only to the cedars. So there's like, for instance, a cypress tree that only grows there. There are two orchids that only grow there. And there's tons. I think there's 11 endemic species in the cedars. And there's like hot springs and like really weird like lime kind of like like um, like calcified deposits that come out of the ground that look like wedding cakes that are really tall. Right. And and so they're trying to turn it into a national park and no one has really access to it because it's like landlocked and they're all private owners. And I we've tried to hike there twice. We get turned away by private landowners. And, you know, these are like. They got shotguns. It's not you're not yeah, really right. allowed to do that. So yeah, so yeah. we we stopped doing that. We tried many times to like learn who owned the land. You know, we looking through public records or Onyx, you know, the app, the hunting app. And we just I've never been there and I can see it from the land. So and I'm okay with not seeing it because there's something magic about this. It's like this perfect just knowing pure, it's there. Yeah, this perfect per, you know, like pure creative space that you actually can't get to, which is like what, you know, I've said before is like, that's what you do when you're writing a song. You're trying to, to find this like magical creative perfection ideal that you never, ever get to, but it keeps you going. It's out there on the horizon. It's the yes. oasis. It's you can where see it. You just can't. Yeah. Well, well, it's it's like with anything in life. I mean, there's you have to have goals, really. And yes. there's like, yep. there's things that you're that you're looking to achieve. You're like, well, what is that? I'm like, it's you know, uh, obviously, almost exclusively in the creative world. You're, you're like, I I don't know, but when I get there, I'll I'll know it. Or yep. like, yeah. what are you looking for? I mean, yep. I, I I don't know. I just have to just keep doing this. Yep. And and it, it, it it's in the doing. It's not actually in the arriving, right? Yes, 100%. Are we getting too like easternly philosophical here? No, we're great. <laughs> we're the best. <laughs> well, dude, you are so fascinating, John Vanderslice. Thanks Thank so you. much, man, for that was uh, great. For, ha- for hanging with me for it was um it was a pleasure talking to you about all this kind of stuff and um Hell yeah. And uh, when I say all this kind of stuff, I mean your music world and your little slice haha of yeah. the music <laughs> industry yeah. and world and man i hope we get back to everything and i'm so Me too. sorry that that shit. like the studio shit's not really happening for you right now yeah you know we'll be but, back and this whole thing will be back it's t- it's it's a uh, yeah this is a uh, uh, unwanted journey but we're on it so here we are so yeah, let's, nothing let's, you can do. It's a train it. that we're all. Yeah, I think there's yep. some there's some silver linings. But um, in the meantime, I'm psyched to hear that you've got some new stuff coming out too. So that'll be cool. What did you say? I think I got it down here. EP in April and uh, LP and in, a record in, in, in August. Yeah, awesome. Yep. That'll be great, oh, yeah. man. I'm looking forward to seeing you on tour. So I want to talk to these guys in Champagne, the uh, the Undertow. Oh yeah, Undertow. They're incredible. Yeah. 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 So email when, me. I'll we'll, put, I'll put you in the loop with them. Yeah. Right on. Um, are you? Uh, are you, you're gonna tour around and do some of this new material, or um, what's kind of what do you think? What you're thinking right now? The second I'm allowed to, I'm I'm out of the house. The second I can do it, and it's and it's right safe on. for people, and I I don't I really. I really don't want to be in a backyard with limited capacity looking at people in masks. So I, I'm, I'm going to do what you might be I'm looking at pieces out. and you, we, we there's going to be people in masks. So I don't I like know. it either. But I'm like trying to get my brain wrapped around that. I know. I, I think September. But it's better than October, getting sick, man. Yeah. But but people are going to be vaccinated. But there's it, yeah. it's insane at some point. If you're if you if you have Pfizer or Moderna running through your bloodstream, there is no way you should be in a mask. You know, they just bought what three hundred million more Pfizer. Yeah, and yeah, I saw that. I saw that. And which those is only one hundred and fifty. That's still only one hundred and fifty million people getting vaccinated, right? Yeah, Except but you've for that got. One. We have ten percent already vaccinated. Yeah, that's in true. The US. Okay, so that's fine. huge. Ten so percent. But yeah, we'll take thirty. You've got Astra- million. AstraZeneca, which doesn't cover the Brazilian variant, but it's still, and you've got Johnson Johnson coming. You're going to have people that have multiple vaccines in their bloodstreams, which is fucking, I'd take all of them if I could, honestly. <laughs> yeah, right. I'm, Let's make a I'm, cocktail. Seriously, I would honestly take a fucking cocktail and get this shit over with. <laughs> well, you'd take a cocktail of all kinds of shit, man. <laughs> Actually, I'm pretty careful about drugs. I, I test this MDMA. I bought it from the dark web and I tested it with reagent and it's 100% MDMA. I would never take street drugs. I know ever. nothing about this shit, but like, what do you mean you tested it with reagent? I, 
you 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 buy reagent. It's a chemical like you can chemically like test MDMA, and by the color variant, you can see. Oh, know that what, what you're getting is. is what you think. Yeah, that you're it's hundred percent MDMA without any meth or any other cutting agents. And that's what you want. You want the drug that you've, you're taking. And is that is that like for creative purposes or just fun purposes? It's for fun purposes, but it's also for life purposes. It keeps you alive. It's like MDMA is one of the most joyful things you could ever do. You know, it's amazing. It's yeah, therapeutic. Yeah. But it's but I'm also a, I like drugs. I'm not going to wrap it, wrap it in like language of like medicine and shit. That's not a fucking secret. I mean, I knew yeah. that going in. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty <laughs> obvious about it. All right, my friend, I'm gonna. You're the best. Thanks, I'm sending you this right so now. Much, so just Sean. email me if you have trouble with this. Yeah, and uh, and uh, make sure you mention me to Tabor tonight, man. Oh, I will. Hell yeah. I'm yeah, going to yeah, see yeah. him in, in four hours. Yeah, right on. That's so cool. Peace. All right. Peace out, man. You're the best. I really I'm appreciate sending it. this to you right now. Right on. All right. Take care, John. Bye. Bye. Okay. That was John Vanderslice on Road Case. Man, I love that guy. I loved that conversation so much. We went in so many different directions and um, he's such a varied and interesting human uh, both from a musical and a personal perspective. I mean, you know, he says like he's a normie <laughs> uh, for all his uh, varying and different views on music and life and uh, drugs, as you heard, etc. cetera. Um, you know, he's just looking for a personal connection and loves live music for that. Uh, really loves the uh, unique performance aspect of live music and uh, truly believes in the art of musical expression. And that's really obvious both in his own albums and in the albums that he produces, uh, which are quite varied. Uh, the depth and breadth of what he's done is really uh, astounding and very impressive. And uh, I love him for that. But he also expresses a frustration with live music from a sonic standpoint. Um, that's understandable. He's played everywhere from art galleries to bars to uh, opening for other acts and venues and theaters, and even now goes out and uh, works with a company that places him in uh, different types of uh, and varieties of venues, uh, including beauty salons and people's living rooms and backyards, et cetera, that he really loves. Um, but he, he really likes to, to control the sound and control the environment and the louder it gets for him. Um, the kind of more out of control sonically it gets as well, but he's got such an interesting way of articulating his point of view. I really love the way that John communicates and, um, it was just a really interesting conversation and I hope that you really all enjoyed it. Uh, if you enjoyed this episode, um, if you could uh, follow us on socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, we also have a YouTube channel. And of course you can visit us at Patreon uh, to support this podcast, patreon.com slash roadcase pod. Uh, but if you really uh, feel so compelled and are listening to this on your favorite listening platform, if you could rate and review roadcase, that'd be awesome. Um, thanks again for joining us for for this episode. I want to thank John Vanderslice once again so much for being here. Really enjoyed chatting with him and I look forward to catching up with him. Don't forget that he's got an EP coming out in April and he's got a new LP coming out in August. So I'm really excited to hear those and to hear what he's got in store for everybody. Thanks again to John for being here and thanks again for listening to this episode of Road Case. Thanks again so much for listening, and I'd like to encourage everyone to get involved with Roadcase. You can do so in a number of different ways. You can email me at info at roadcasepod.com with questions, comments, and even suggestions for guests. Or you can follow us on the socials, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. We're at Roadcase Pod, and we have a YouTube channel called Roadcase Podcast. And if you are able to and like to support Roadcase, we have a Patreon site at patreon.com slash roadcasepod. And of course, you can subscribe to this podcast on your favorite listening platform. And if you could please rate and review the podcast while you're there, that would be great. So I want to thank Waltzer for this awesome theme music that we have. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in and listening to Roadcase. We have a lot of great episodes coming up, so I'll see you on down the road. <laughs> <laughs>